It's the suspect's name, Brian Koberger. This is his mugshot. It was taken early this morning where he, because he was arrested early this morning around 3 a.m. Eastern time in Scranton, Pennsylvania. We have learned that Koberger is a 28-year-old PhD student in criminal justice at Washington State University. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. I must admit when I put together this article, I was under the impression that I had more information than I actually do have. But we do have the answer to the question, how did they match Koberger's DNA to what they found at the scene? Now, I think it's important to first of all stress that they did find his DNA at the scene. If they didn't, if they hadn't, this would have been a much harder case to pursue, to prosecute, right? So that is actually a big breakthrough. And that is probably something that came through in the last four or five days, that the DNA results likely came back at around about just before Christmas. And that is actually just before Christmas when, they, when the authorities uh, basically started their surveillance in Pennsylvania. Now, once the connection was made via the Elantra and his DNA, the 20-year-old criminology student Brian Koberger was seized in a SWAT team raid at his parents' home at 1.30 a.m. It does seem to be quite a sort of simple, I don't want to say grim, but a quite a, a simple um, residence. And one kind of gets the idea that, especially if the car wasn't his, that Koberger isn't a particularly well-off student, definitely not a privileged student, certainly not uh, comparable to the kids at, in the funhouse. In any event, hours later, hours after he was seized, he appeared in court, he was arrested on a fugitive from justice warrant, and he was remanded without bond to the Monroe County Correctional Facility. And he's there now awaiting extradition to Idaho, that's according to police. In Idaho, he will face charges of felony burglary and four counts of first-degree murder. I did say in the live that that felony burglary shows he wasn't invited into the house and he was there when some of the victims arrived later. He arrived once they were all asleep and somehow gained access, possibly through that keypad. And that suggests that he'd had access before. According to the Daily Mail, Koberger has no prior arrests, right? No criminal record. And so it is unclear how officials got hold of his DNA. So, of course, we know his DNA was gotten hold of at the crime scene, probably in a mixed sample and probably left in his own blood as well. The question is, how were they able to match his DNA? And we're going to deal with that in this episode. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. Uh, welcome to the thousands of you who have subscribed. Welcome to the channel. Um, if you're enjoying this episode, like, share, leave a comment, and let's get started. According to WPBF.com, quote, Retired Special Agent John McVie told an investigative reporter, Terry Parker, that Koberger does not have a vehicle registered in his name and, as we said before, no criminal history. And that meant that police were running DNA and fingerprint checks from the crime scene on a national database. And so, obviously, doing that, Koberger would not have shown up as a match, right? That includes running the DNA. Uh, it, he wouldn't have come up as a match either. Okay, so how did they find him? Well, we know the Elantra was registered to the address where they nabbed him. So if the vehicle wasn't registered in his name, well, it was registered probably in his parents' name. And um, it was actually that simple how they were able to actually uh, track, certainly link him to the address where he was found. So probably the vehicle belongs to his parents, which maybe means that he doesn't even have his own vehicle. That alone, as I said earlier, gives us potentially very interesting insight into this guy. He might be kind of a down-on-his-luck fella, guy who doesn't really have a lot of money. And someone who is looking on at some of the residents of the funhouse as privileged and entitled, and maybe with jealousy, maybe with envy. I mean, compare him borrowing a beat-up 10-year-old Elantra to Kaylee buying an almost new Range Rover 
and jet setting to Europe. But how did they get a DNA match? Well, according to CNN, quote, authorities narrowed their focus to Koberger after tracing his ownership of the white Yande Elantra seen in the area of the killings, according to two law enforcement sources briefed on the investigation. Koberger's DNA has also been matched to genetic material recovered at the off-campus house where the students were stabbed to death, according to the sources. Okay, but how? How did they link it? Now, according to CNN, it's the only source I've been able to find that provides this information. They say genetic genealogy helped investigators identify the suspect, a source with knowledge of the case said. DNA found in Idaho was taken through a public database to find potential matches for family members, the source said. Now, I don't know whether you would necessarily have family members on a database unless either they've committed a crime or if they've volunteered their DNA in order to trace family history. So I'm not quite sure where that particular statement gets us. Anyway, according to the same article, it says, Quote, once potential family matches were found, subsequent investigative work by law enforcement led to the identification of Koberger, according to the source. Now, if you take that literally, they saw potential family matches and then they did subsequent investigative work. Now, one wonders what that actually means. Now, what I'm going to say here isn't it's my opinion uh, i certainly haven't read this anywhere and i don't know it as a fact but it is possible while doing surveillance for four days the feds gathered they may have gathered dna samples from the garbage outside the house what else would they have been doing except sitting out there and waiting one of the other things they could have done is gathered dna samples from the garbage um, including from his parents they could also have gone via the route that he took from um, Washington all the way to Pennsylvania, more than 2,000 miles. And I don't think they did this, but another way they could have retrieved DNA is following the route and then looking at the garbage he left there. Unlikely, but that would have been an alternative. And so what they probably, or what they possibly did was via this route, um, getting the garbage from the family home, they might have actually found his parents' DNA or even his DNA and then ran a test through that. Once it gave a bingo to what was found at the crime scene, well, case closed. Now, as I say, I don't know for a fact whether this is what they did do, but what is very interesting is there are certain legal prescriptions around uh, police rummaging through your trash um, and collecting your DNA through a warrantless collection, right? Police may not need a warrant to, to rummage through your trash, but according to certain information that I've seen, warrantless collection of DNA is unconstitutional. Did that happen yet? Well, we don't know. Going back to the article, the suspect drove across country in the white car to his parents' house, according to another law enforcement source. Sometime right before Christmas, right, this is the vital part, right before Christmas we were zeroing in on him being in or going to Pennsylvania. So that suggests that they were actually tailing him and that's another way they could have picked up his DNA as if they were following him and if he stopped to have a meal somewhere, they could then seize a discarded cup or something and also test that for DNA. So the other thing that's technically quite interesting is I was actually right about them catching this guy, certainly closing in on this guy before Christmas, right? Going back to the article, while he was being watched, investigators from the Moscow PD, from the Idaho State Police Homicide Bureau and the FBI worked with prosecutors to develop sufficient probable cause to obtain the warrant. Once the arrest warrant was issued, the Pennsylvania State Police and FBI made the arrest. It's hard to believe, but Koberger actually attended class in a sort of business-as-usual fashion a few days after the murders, before driving home for the holidays. That's according to the Seattle Times, that uh, he was a graduate student at the Pullman campus. That's about eight miles from the funhouse. And he actually attended classes and finished the semester 
at WSU after the slayings. That's according to a former classmate. So Koberg was actually in class and finished the semester after the killings. So we are quickly finding out more about Koberg, the who of this guy. Relatives say he was OCD about veganism. And some people said that he seemed to be, he looked as though he was on drugs while he was attending school. It's unconfirmed as yet, but a former friend has said on TikTok, and this was actually picked up on News Nation as well, that when she knew him, and she provides a few photos of herself with Coburg in the background, I think she's also had a wedding with him, that he was a heavy heroin user. That may be how, when he looked into the abyss of crime and criminal justice, it looked back at him, and dark fantasies began weaving and spinning in a twisted mind and heart. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.